I'm here with Andy Fritchley of Kelsey Design. Actually, you know what? I'll let you do the introduction yourself. Oh, thank you. Um, Andy Fritchley here. I am a brand strategist with Kelsey Advertising and Design here in LaGrange. Brand strategist. Brand strategist. Yeah, we really don't know what that is. Okay, I was gonna ask, what does that mean? It's just a made up word, right? A made okay. up term. No, for real, we, uh, we build brands. Um, what we say is from the inside out. We, we specialize in brand development, which most people would think is something like logo development. Okay. Ads and marketing, and of course that's part of it, but um, it goes just a little bit deeper deeper than that. So I'm a strategist, I align myself with our clients' brands and, and we build them up from the inside out. So that could mean like internal training, um, really good business partnerships, things of that nature. And of okay. course, a lot of what we do is, you know, external marketing, social media, digital advertising, okay. maintaining their websites, things of that nature. Okay. Now, I came across you through the Visit LaGrange Instagram page, correct? Yes, you did. So, Visit LaGrange is one of our clients. I am the brand strategist for Visit LaGrange. We have a, a great team that works on that client and okay. works on all sorts of things related to tourism in LaGrange, Georgia. So that, you know, we run their social media accounts, which is how we met you, mm -hmm. how we bumped into you. You uh, saw some of our posts and we had a dialogue over Instagram. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we maintain their Facebook page, the Twitter, Twitter feed. We do digital advertising and billboards and the Visit LaGrange website. Okay. So, yeah, so I'm a brand strategist for Okay. LaGrange. So it's not you just fiddling behind the scenes. There's a group of people with the Visit LaGrange web, the Visit LaGrange Instagram page. Right. Yeah. There's a team of us. Okay. Who? who yeah. It's not not just me. It would be far too much work for just one person. But okay. Yeah. All right then. The neat part about my job is every day is a little different. So because we're in the brand building business, mm -hmm. really we're creating stories. Mm -hmm. And we're creating content surrounding your brand. Okay. The, the most of this content does get published mm -hmm. out on the internet in some form or fashion. Okay. Again, whether that's social media, uh, that's, that's a lot of it nowadays, as you know. Um, and website, blog posts, digital ads. So my day revolves around the content, creating content on behalf of our client. Okay. And understanding where and how it needs to be published, where and how it needs to be boosted with media buys. Uh, you know, some days I may be doing a photo shoot. Some days I may be flying a drone. Um, some days I'm behind my machine and we're, we're working on ads, working on copy and content, um, building websites, building new landing pages, just okay. kind of the what marketing looks like in 2019, 2020. It's just it's a more surgical, um, tactical approach, and it's just we specialize in the digital part of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I saw some recent pictures, aerial pictures of Beacon, of, no, Wild Leap Brewing Company. Was that you? Right, yeah. So that I captured some drone footage of Wild Leap. Pretty recently, yes. Okay. Awesome. When I constructed this list of questions, I came from a very outside-centric perspective. Like, I came from a perspective of one who, moved, who hadn't lived in the Grange their whole life. Right. Have you lived in the Grange your whole life? No, I have not. Okay. Okay, so how long have you done this in the Grange? So, the, the back story is... Um, I moved to LaGrange in 1996. Okay. So this is the Olympic Games. Okay. Is coming to Atlanta, and I'm a student at Georgia Tech. Okay. I'm in the midst of all of this. And so I graduate from Tech and come down to LaGrange, Georgia to go work for Milliken & Company. Okay. And so uh, I was an engineer. I, I graduated with a mechanical engineering degree from Tech, and I was really eager to get in the workforce. and. Mm -hmm. Milliken was a really good fit for me. Okay. So, um, you know, we, we have a very deep 
and rich textile tradition mm -hmm. here in LaGrange. And, and, and at the time, uh, there were plenty of textile mills in this area still running strongly and it was a thriving economy. And so that's initially what brought me here um, via my wife. My wife's family has been in LaGrange for decades. Uh, she was born and raised here, as okay. was her brother. Okay. And, um, and, you know, behind the scenes, I think, you know, my future in-laws, they were, they were pulling the strings a little bit to, to, to lure us back to this area. And, you know, now looking back, I can see their evil plan worked quite well. All right, funny story. Um, I believe I told you I couldn't find Kelsey Design Studio because I was looking in the wrong place. Right. All right. Um, now, picture me standing in front of that building, the old Crest building. Right. I'm looking at the signs on the one side and the other, and I go, shoot. Because I'm looking and I don't see, I don't see Kelsey on either side. I scan the board on the left, I scan the board on the right, and I don't see Kelsey on either side. And I go, shoot. And this woman behind me goes, who, why? Who are you looking for? And I turn. And I, I don't know what happened, but I just, I go, huh, I'll just take a chance. Andy Fridgely, Kelsey Design. She goes, oh, let me call his mother-in-law. And she pulls out her phone and she makes a call. And she goes, I think he teaches at the high school now. She, no, she's, I think he coaches at the high school now, full time. And she picks up the phone and makes a phone call. Doesn't Andy, the high school, doesn't Andy coach at the high school now? Nope, he's at Kelsey still? Okay, well, where's it, where's that located at? A Coca-Cola building? Okay. And she's like, okay. Right on, yeah. yeah. And she, and it was Babs. Right, yeah. So I, yeah, I'm not sure, you know, do you know Babs? I know you, yeah, I do. And it's funny, because that's just quintessential LaGrange right there, is we kind of all know each other in mm -hmm. one form or another. And yeah, so, yeah, it's funny because I, I do coach at the high school, but it's purely a community coach, uh, you know, part-time kind of thing. I, I am a brand strategist well, yeah. first and foremost, but it's neat that you, you do wear a lot of hats mm -hmm. around here. Um, just a small community and everybody does a lot of different things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, being a former teacher, I, I, the idea that you somehow could be a full-time coach, it just that boggled my mind, <laughs> especially in a small school like LaGrange. Like, football is where, you know, where they get full-time coaches. That's right, yeah. It's just soccer having a full-time coach, it just boggled my mind. Well, you know, that's the little, uh, the little secret is that really it's I have two full-time jobs, uh, <laughs> coaching high school soccer. Coaching high school anything yes. is time-consuming, and so... Uh, yeah, I'm very lucky and blessed to have a career that's flexible. Yes. So we do so much digital marketing and things on a computer, things I can do at night or mm -hmm. on the weekend, and uh, I don't have to be behind a, you know, at a desk, mm -hmm. uh, nine to five kind of deal. So, yeah, I do spend some time on the soccer field. Mm -hmm. So that that is one of the things I'm known for and around the Grange is is. Coaching soccer, you know, before the high school, I coached um, club soccer. Actually, I'm picking up club soccer again in the spring. Um, before that was rec. So I've been coaching my kids since they were four, basically. Mm -hmm. So many, many years now. Oh, so that's how you got into it, was coaching your kids? Well, I was a soccer player first and foremost. Okay. I started playing when I was seven. Okay. I'm from Gainesville, Georgia, and I, I played on the very first – recreational soccer team ever in Gainesville. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is nearly 40 years ago now. And um, when, when, I had, when we had our kids, mm -hmm. I knew eventually that I would introduce them to the sport. Mm -hmm. um, and sure enough, when they turned four, they were out there on the field with me awesome. uh, showing them the game. Yeah. That's really cool. We covered that you came to LaGrange in 1996. When did you start with Kelsey? And is there a story behind it? There, there is. There's always a story, right? Um, so, is the, is the story one you want to tell? Absolutely. Okay. I, I'm an open book. Okay. So, um, so coming into textiles, you know, out of Georgia Tech into Milliken, um, I was a process engineer. Absolutely loved what I what I did at the okay. time, and it was more of a hands-on kind of engineering position, mm -hmm. which 
is really the only way I'd prefer to do things. It's just really get in, roll up your sleeves, and you know, get get dirty. So, um, around uh, a couple years into my career, I did well. I got a, you know, a few promotions, that sort of thing. I was very very happy. But at the time, the the United States started looking at more of these trade agreements. Okay, and so. Um, around the early 2000s is when the, the NAFTA mm-hmm. trade agreement went into place. And really that um, had a profound impact on local textiles mm-hmm. in a negative way. Yeah. And so the writing was on the wall. Um, and, and I knew that, you know, this was probably not a 40 year career for me. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, it propelled me forward. It gave me lots of experience. I loved what I did understand processes, you know, all that mm-hmm. typical nerdy engineer stuff. Yeah. But at the time, the internet was just at its infancy stage, and I was very curious about it. And so I had an idea for a website that I wanted to build, but I didn't know how to go about doing that. I didn't know anything about it. Okay. So I bumped into this fellow mm-hmm. um, named Brant Kelsey, who knew a little bit about this thing. He's been building websites, these early, early websites for radio stations back in Kansas and doing some work for McDonald's Corporation of all things. Okay. And we started talking and he, he figured out real fast that I was ambitious and I was curious and I was a go-getter and, and he had more work than he knew what to do with. And before you know it, we, I had resigned from Milliken and took this complete leap of faith into this career where the, the, the path was very fuzzy. Oh, wow. So just really didn't know what the future held for me, right? Mm-hmm. But it turned out to be the right kind of leap of faith. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my children were very young at the time. They were mm-hmm. basically just infants. Um, so it's really kind of a good time to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but... Back then, the internet was just the Wild West. I mean, there were no rules, there, was no, there were no textbooks, there were no degrees yeah. that you could get. And so we learned everything on our own through searches, through uh, just peer, peer reviews. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, I think that's really what helped us propel us forward is that we, we understand still to this day how to code a site by hand. Mm-hmm. So we understand all of the framework that goes in behind it. Okay. So that that's really the story of me j- jumping over to Kelsey. So I was like, I was employee number one. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. And so that was 15 years ago, um, and and we really just haven't looked back since. So it it started with the web world, forms and and sort of your uh, your back end programming, mm-hmm. and then it morphed. It, it turned more into like this brand world. We understood that a website really is a tool for your business. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not just widgets, it's not just forms, but it's really a touch point for your business. Mm-hmm. And so as an agency, we figured out that we really more, were more in the brand building world. We weren't, we weren't a web shop, which is what we thought we were. Mm-hmm. Like, no, we're, we're more in the storytelling business. So that goes back about 10 years. So uh, I've been a brand strategist for uh, right, at, right at 10 years. Well, that helps me better understand your title too. Yeah, so my, my wife, um, born and raised here. Yeah. And How would you first meet your wife? So yeah, it's was, was a great story. Um, sure, so I'm just a little bit older than my wife. So I'm, I'm enrolled at Tech and I I settled into a, a fraternity. Okay. And the during fraternity rush, um, I I see this I see this girl, and we we start talking to each other, and and we just immediately hit it off. And, and you know, gosh, I it's kind of mind blowing to think that I that's that was my future wife at the time. We just. It was her, literally her first week at, at Georgia Tech, and, mm-hmm. and she's doing the sorority rush thing, and, and I was already a brother at the time, but I'm recruiting, you know, trying to recruit pledges, and, mm-hmm. and uh, 
that, that goes to show you right there that like sometimes uh, I should have been focused on recruiting pledges and I was uh, t talking to this pretty girl at the time too, so maybe I was not doing my job as well as I sh should have been doing, but um, I'm sure I'm glad that I had that conversation. And so um, I think we started dating officially maybe a month later, kind of deal just really hit off. And, um, and so she, uh, her parents uh, helped me get a few internships here oh, okay. uh, over the summers. I, I just really liked to work, mm -hmm. and I, I, I worked all during school, and, and so I, I interned at Milliken for a couple summers before okay. I actually took a, took a job mm -hmm. there. So um, that's what originally brought me to town. Oh, okay. Now, did she come from a prominent family in town? Yeah, I mean, like her, her, her dad was um, a, a business a business guy okay. in in the Kex division of Milliken. He was a controller, um, and then a lot of people know her um, her mother, the mm -hmm. mother in law, uh, my mother in law, uh, Andrea, mainly because she she worked for the newspaper oh, okay. for decades. Got it, and and eventually became the editor of LaGrange Daily News and so she was very much in the public mm -hmm. public eye got it mm -hmm. and which is a really a tricky role because mm -hmm. um, you, you're covering politics and you're covering kind of tricky subject matter mm -hmm. and you're constantly out there in the public eye too it's quite the negotiation and you really and you're taking you're taking a stand sometimes mm -hmm. and you're in but I felt like uh, she's really well Respected uh -huh. mainly because um, when they took a stand on an issue, it was something that was good for Lagrange. Uh -huh. It was it was bigger than the person writing the article. It was like this is the the big picture, the the macro view of what's good for Lagrange, and and I have to say that that influenced me. So I, I, I when I hear about a project or you know something that's going to disrupt Lagrange, uh -huh. I'm I'm really trying to keep an open mind about. You know the greater good and so you know these past five or ten years we've been very blessed to see a lot of change positive change happen in the Grange there's a lot of good activity that's been that's that's happened mm -hmm. that's changed us as a community for the better mm -hmm. got it favorite story about living here I'm not sure I have a favorite stories I have okay. many pick one many many favorites but I I think I do need to tell the just one that just popped in my head. Um, oh man, let's go for it. We uh, last couple of years, uh, I've got this thing where I wear uh, like a mascot costume. Okay. I mean, like on Halloween. Okay. And I'm a I'm a I'm not a shy person. I'm pretty quiet. Uh huh. Except when I get into the mascot costume, <laughs> and then I just kind of open up, and so it's it's a lot of fun just to run around and. Like give everybody high fives and just mm -hmm. be silly and um, so this one particular year uh, I was wearing a, a skunk costume okay and this is like a full legit mascot costume okay I mean it's got the head it's got like the tail college mascot I mean yeah it's okay it's not an inexpensive costume mm -hmm. that I was wearing and it was Halloween and I'm just I'm walking down the sidewalk and I'm getting stopped and people are taking pictures with me, you know, it's, it's, it's hilarious. <laughs> and, uh, and on the other side of the sidewalk, as I'm walking, I see my wife's brother. So my brother, in law I see him and he's a, a pretty hefty guy, right? You know, football player. Mm -hmm. And I see him and I start jogging towards him. I cross the street. And I slowly start to speed up, and I'm running towards him. And now I'm running like full speed towards him. And um, I, as I get close to him, I just jump. <laughs> I jump straight into his arms, right, and just latch onto him. And I'm just like squeezing him, right, and he's squeezing me back, and he's saying, "I don't know who you are," <laughs> and he's chuckling and stuff, right. And um, anyways, I jump down. I give him a high five and then I just take off running the other direction. <laughs> and I was just, 
I was crying to myself as I'm, I'm just laughing and crying as I'm running away. It was just, it was a priceless moment. But that's, that's what I love about Lagrange too, is that, you know, particularly when it comes to your kids and your family, Mm -hmm. we all like to have fun. Yes, and, sort of things. and you can um, molest a stranger in a scum <laughs> costume, and they're okay with it because they and trust that you've got good intentions. <laughs> they're like, I don't know who you are, but you gave me a hug, and it must be okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> point. What's been your highest point while living in the Grange? Well, it's neat because non skunk suit related. You know, yeah, okay. Well, that have to scratch off a lot off the list. <laughs> It's neat because so many of my personal and family milestones uh-huh. have come here. So, you know, we were married here. Uh-huh. We bought our first house here. We had, you know, we've had three children here uh-huh. and um, they've been baptized here. So we've had all these neat milestones. So, but outside of the personal things, I would just say the highest point is several but it really revolves around the, the achievements of the community. Okay. So I've always been really impressed with our leadership here and the fact that we knew that in order for us to be a thriving, you know, an economically relevant town, mm-hmm. that we needed to work on our quality of life, that we okay. needed some of these assets to be more well-rounded mm-hmm. and to attract really good talent. Okay. So, so things like, for instance, um, Delavant. Mm-hmm. We, we needed that downtown. We, mm-hmm. we, needed, um, we needed Sweetland Amphitheater. Mm-hmm. We, we needed Wild Leap. Mm-hmm. We needed uh, South Bend Park. And, mm-hmm. and we need the thread. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Looking back from when I first came here to now, no, none of those things existed. Mm-hmm. And so even trying to attract new, uh, new talent to Millican, you know, these engineers, these really smart guys and girls out of, out of school, it was difficult. Mm-hmm. You know, you, there wasn't much to offer. Uh, but now it's that, that proposition looks way different. And so people are attracted here because we have really nice things Mm -hmm. um, that they can enjoy and they're actually seeing the long term the the long term gain too saying this is a place where I could raise my family Mm -hmm. this is where I could start my family and have a you know a thriving small business or have a really good career Mm -hmm. I hadn't considered that but yeah and then I guess right after that you know we have things like you know, our very first beer festival, which ultimately did bring Wild Leap here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we had our, you know, uh, Rockweave Music Festival just happened this past mm-hmm. fall. Yes. So uh, we have the International, uh, the Life Festival, on, you know, downtown. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Food Fest. Um, huge St. Patrick Day events. Mm-hmm. Of course, we've always been big on the holidays and um, whether it's July 4th, mm-hmm. the celebrations of the there. Christmas Parade. Um, we, we know how to celebrate. We know how to have, we know how to have a good time here, and mm-hmm. um, so all those things. Even the Mardi Gras parade. I mean, it's it's fantastic. It's mm-hmm. it's so much fun. But uh, so it looks more like a microcosm of like a pocket community of Atlanta now, where it's there's a lot of activity, a lot of cultural things to do, okay. a lot of things you can do with your family, music and food. I hadn't considered it a pocket community of Atlanta. But that's a really good way of putting it. Atlanta culture encapsulated, but not all the good stuff encapsulated without a lot of the bad stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So our, our proposition for living here is very easy. It's mm-hmm. very simple. It, it's basically a lot of the amenities mm-hmm. that you would see in a big city, but none of the headaches, particularly... Mm-hmm. You can get in your car and go almost anywhere in 10 minutes. Yeah. Right? And so for someone like me who wears a lot of different hats, I need to – sometimes I need to be at the high school, and then in five minutes I need to be downtown, and I can do that. Mm-hmm. You can even walk, quite frankly, yeah. and do a lot of those things or ride a bike. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you're seeing that more and more. You see people 
more pedi- more pedestrian mm-hmm. activity. Um, Shoot, when I lived in Atlanta, it took me a half an hour to get from one light well, from one light to another. Not kidding, that's a true story. Like it took me a half an hour to get from one red light to another, and that's just incredibly frustrating. Yes, you know, I mean, because Atlanta is very spread out. I mean, you you can't unless you live and work in a pocket community mm-hmm. like we. Um, it's difficult. You, you're going to need a car there. Mm-hmm. The, quite frankly, the mass transit is not the best. It just mm-hmm. doesn't really take you that many places. Yeah. Um, but but here it's it's a lot different. Um, mm-hmm. And and plus, it, you know, if you have business in Atlanta, particularly if you have business where you need to travel, we are on the right side of Atlanta for mm-hmm. Hartsfield Airport. I mean, the, you you can be you can mm-hmm. be to the airport in sixty minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, no issues whatsoever. Rarely do you ever hit any kind of traffic jam. Nope. Door to door from my house to my from my from my door to Hartsfield Jackson, drop off on the curb in sixty minutes. Bingo. Yeah. And I live on the north side of Lagrange. Like, it takes me twenty minutes to get to the highway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you don't have the exit up there. Yeah. But yeah. What is your favorite spot or place in Lagrange? Well, since I'm a, a soccer guy, uh, I'd have to say anywhere on a soccer field would be my favorite spot. So that it might be uh, over the soccer complex. Uh, we, you know, we play games at Cowley Stadium. Or Where is the soccer complex? The soccer complex is on the south side okay. of Lagrange, like you're going to Great Wolf Lodge. Okay. It's it's just off of two nineteen. Uh, so it's. I don't think I saw that. It is just off the road. So you, I don't know if there's a sign there, but it's where um, the the a partial por- portion of the West Georgia Tech campus is. It's it's. Um, I know West Georgia Tech. Right? Where's your West Georgia Tech is down there. I know no. both campuses. Yeah, it's the small little campus. It's right across from the small campus. Okay. Callaway Center. Is right across from here. Okay. Right I don't, behind. I don't write about where you're talking. But right behind uh, Whitesville Road Elementary School. Okay. So that's where the soccer complex is. Um, but high school, we play home games at Calway Stadium. Mm-hmm. So um, we play and practice there, and then of course up at the high school. Mm-hmm. At the, I don't know if you've used the track right there, but. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, I mean, one of my favorite places is enjoying the thread. Okay. I, I, I think that it's a really spectacular trail, um, particularly, you know, now, now they're up to like seven miles now and it's becoming connected. And you know, as we're doing this podcast, uh, just a block from here, they're building the connecting piece. Mm-hmm. They'll take you basically from Granger, Granger Park. Mm-hmm. It'll cut you through downtown and and connect you over to South Bend Park. Okay, so awesome. So it's just pretty, pretty neat. And it's, that's no small feat because they're having to move utilities and it's, it's just, it's much easier just to build it through like a, you know, some, some woods or a mm-hmm. gra- grassy area, but, you know, going through this urban area, they're having to relocate things and it's, uh, and it's, it goes right by our office, matter of fact. Wow. Um, you know, so it's the thread, but, you know, uh, I love I love Wild Leap. I love anywhere downtown. Um, there's really no better place to see a concert than Sweetland Amphitheater. It's pretty spectacular place to to be. So I think I have many okay many favorites. So what's your favorite go What's your go to order at your favorite Lagrange restaurant or bar? Well, I think you you just can't go wrong with Charlie Joseph's. Okay. So, for me, it's uh, it's a chili cheese dog. Or really, it's two. Two chili <laughs> cheese dogs all the way with a bottle of Coke. Okay. Because we all know that Coca-Cola tastes much better in a glass bottle. Yes. No doubt. What's the hidden gem in the Grange that no one else knows about? I don't know if this is so much... A hidden gem, 
but you, you know, I think you have a tendency to forget about it, but going out by the lake, particularly somewhere like uh, Pine Road Park, um, it's, you know, it's, it's out a little ways from town, mm-hmm. but it's built on this little peninsula almost, okay. right by West Point Lake, and it's, it's cleared, so there's not very many trees out there, and mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's known for hosting events, you know, some fishing tournaments. That's where the, the mega boat ramp is located. Um, we've had a, some music festivals out there, and of course the fireworks mm-hmm. are out there as well. And, but it's just the, this panoramic view of West Point Lake, and it's just, it's just gorgeous, um, particularly when the sun starts going down. Mm-hmm. It's just really spectacular. Um, all of my kids run cross country for okay. LaGrange and that's where LaGrange will have some of their meets out there's a neat place to, to run mm-hmm. they run through the trails and through kind of the grassy areas and every time we go out there just it's just really breathtaking okay and so I don't you know everybody pretty much knows about it mm-hmm. but you just you forget how, how beautiful it is out that way And is there anything I should have asked but didn't? I think one one of the things that uh, that you, you might want to ask me about is uh, is running. Is I think a lot of people know me for soccer, but I I am also known for running. And I did run cross country in high school, and I like. Uh, like soccer, I started my kids out running very early. We did a lot of the little kind of mini races here and, and stuff like that. Um, and all three of them run cross country, as I just said mm-hmm. to you. But um, when I was when I was nearing my fortieth birthday, okay, I was just thinking to myself, uh, what what could I do to to really symbolize this this milestone that I'm having, this, you know, this, this uh, significant birthday. And, you know, should I have a party? Should I, you know, should go on this, a cool trip? Or, you know, what should we do to celebrate? And ultimately I decided that I wanted to do a marathon somewhere exotic. Mm-hmm. Just make it, a, make it a trip, you know, make it an adventure kind of deal. And I found several that, that appealed to me, and I wanted to do it around my birthday, which is in May. I think or, or you're also a Taurus. Mm-hmm. So um, I wanted to do it around my birthday, and I found this marathon in China where you actually traverse a portion of the Great Wall mm-hmm. as part of the marathon. It also goes way out into the countryside, and you run through these like these little impoverished communities and stuff, like way out in these farms and fields and stuff it's um but a significant portion i think maybe six or seven miles of it are on the great wall itself and they the chinese did not build the wall like around the mountains and through valleys Mm -hmm. they went directly over the tops of mountains and to keep the mongolians out Mm -hmm. right so this this wall you're looking at it and it just goes straight up I mean, absolutely, the steepest thing you've ever seen in your life, and you get to run it. <laughs> you get to go up it, you get to go down it. And I remember right around like, so a uh, marathon is 26.2 okay. miles. Mm-hmm. I remember at mile 20, so well into it, you're pretty much exhausted at this point, was the hardest portion of the marathon. And so they called that section of the wall the goat trail. And it, it's because you, I had to climb it, basically. I had to use my, my not only my legs, and, but I had to use my arms and hands just to climb up this portion of the wall. Oh, wow. For, for nearly a mile, right? <laughs> and, and there's some altitude, so you really can't breathe. Mm-hmm. Um, anyways, uh, that's, that's a pretty, pretty neat story. Uh, my wife was there with me. She went the whole thing? She, she, there was a couple places where you ran by this kind of open pavilion area. So she stayed there and watched me go by and took a few pictures, you know, as I'm going by and, you know, offered some words of encouragement. Got it. For me. 
yeah, so I, I, I survived it. <laughs> wow. I was able to do it, and um, definitely one of those things you never forget. Holy cow. That's impressive. I got to say, I, I'm exhausted walking three miles, let alone running 26.8. That's impressive. Thank you, thank you. It, and the neat part too is it's all part of a tour package as well. So we got to do all of the neat stuff in Beijing. Oh, cool. Um, all of the sites. And it was mainly people from, um, from Europe. So oh, okay. we met all kinds of different nationalities. Um, you know, got to, get to hear about their, their homes, their families, their mm -hmm. culture, and then share these you know, fantastic experience mm -hmm. in, in, in China. And, and quite frankly, the Chinese um, in Beijing, they don't normally travel outside of their country or outside their city. Okay. So seeing foreigners for them is actually really cool. So some of the Chinese would come up to you and like un uncomfortably close oh. to you. Okay like with a couple inches of your face and just stare at you. They, they have not seen foreigners. They just don't see them very much. Okay. And so we are unusual looking to them. I did not think that's where that story was going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I remember this gentleman, he was standing a couple inches from my face and he, he, he wasn't being rude. Mm -hmm. He was just taking it all in. <laughs> there, was a, there was a family uh, they were from Israel, and the wife had this long blonde hair, and they had two girls. So it was a family of four, mm -hmm. the, wi the wife, um, the dad, and the two girls. Mm -hmm. And all the women had long blonde hair. Okay. And they don't have, they did, they don't have blonde hair in China. Yeah. They had not seen these kind of folks. Yeah. And so they joked to us that over the week or so that they were in China, they probably were asked to pose for about a thousand pictures. <laughs> People wanted to have their kids in a picture with the blonde haired kids <laughs> because we were an anomaly. Mm -hmm. So it, it was just, it was really neat uh, to be able to experience some of that stuff and just, you know, very strange as well. Now, were your children able to come on that trip with you? No, they stayed home with uh with the grandparents okay. and i remember you know facetiming with them from china mm -hmm. um no but we've we've taken them on other family adventures as a matter of fact uh we we have a tradition in our family since we're just a few days from christmas okay we, our, one of our traditions is we don't give our kids a lot of gifts mm -hmm. so santa comes even though my kids are teenagers uh, Santa still comes and, and, and brings presents. But the main thing that mom and dad give, the, give our three kids is we give them a, a trip. Okay. So we go somewhere with them. So it might be, it might be Mexico. It mm -hmm. might be New York. It might be a, a trip on spring break, like Washington, D.C. Got it. So that sort of thing. So we've been very blessed to be able to mm -hmm. have some some great adventures with our kids. Yeah. So you give them an experience rather than presents. Makes sense. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get it. That's a really good idea also. Yeah. We try to make it a little bit of a puzzle. Okay. Bef so when they're opening it up, they kind of have to figure it out. That's awesome. Where they're going. And I think there's a sense of, uh, uh anticipation. Okay. On their part, you know, like where are we going kind of deal. And, one year, I can't, where did we go? I'm not sure, but it was basically like, kids, so this is on Christmas Day, mm -hmm. kids, you're leaving tomorrow for, I think it was Mexico. Okay. Okay. And my wife had, had um, gotten their passports made without them even knowing what they were doing. <laughs> they went to the, like, the, the drugstore and got their pictures taken, and she had a friendly little white lie that she told them, and they, they were... Uh, they were hoodwinked, uh, <laughs> but it was really cool. Really cool. I got on a plane the next day. That's awesome. So exciting. That's wonderful. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure. 
Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. We just shook hands. We're now going to end the interview. Bye.